So because this is our chance to cut back and have some fun with Deadpool, I figured why not tell the story of how he stole the Infinity Gauntlet from Thanos. And what I'm hoping is that at the end of this, you'll have had a little bit of fun, but also walk away appreciating some of the unique stories from his publication history. So Deadpool getting the Infinity Gauntlet actually takes place in the story Deadpool Roast the Marvel Universe and came out of the Death of Deadpool event following the final incursion between Earth-616 and the Ultimate Universe going into Secret Wars. To sidetrack for a second, while Deadpool already had a large cult following at the time due to the writing of Joe Kelly, Jimmy Palmiotti, Frank Thierry, Christopher Priest, and Victor Gishler, in 2012 during Wave 1 of Marvel Now, the popularity of Deadpool reached higher levels for several reasons. The first was that co-writer Brian Poston already had a massive following in geek culture due to his work in Space Ghost Coast to Coast, Aqua Teen Hunger Force, Tom Goes to the Mayor, Super Jaime, as well as multiple stand-up routines. To this end, for those in the geek culture community who were aware of Poston's work but on the fringes of the Deadpool stories, with his involvement alongside Jerry Duggan, his prospective fanbase dipped their toes in the water of his foray into comic books to see if his legacy of comedy would translate effectively. In addition to this, comics that are labeled as number ones usually sell more copies due to potential fans seeing it as a way to jump into an existing character or team without fear of being lost in the expanse of their publication history. While characters like Carol Danvers seem to pick up in the middle of her history and the story focusing on her undertaking of the Captain Marvel mantle, regarding Deadpool, Duggan and Poston followed the same pattern but wrote a series of story arcs in the first 15 issues, after which they launched The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly which focused on his backstory. As a result, the Duggan run of Deadpool can largely be considered self-contained and the fans could essentially read these stories on their own without worrying about the character's history. Having said that, as a pop culture icon, there was also no denying that Deadpool's rise to fame was due more to the smaller contributions made by writers over the history of his publications, which all came together to form the Duggan run. What I mean here is that where Rob Liefeld created Deadpool as a copy of DC's Deathstroke in the 1990s, Joe Kelly made Deadpool a comedic character that parodied his own stories, the superheroes of Marvel Comics, and the comic book industry as a whole. Capitalizing on this, Christopher Priest began having Deadpool break the fourth wall, with writers like Frank Thierry, Rob Rohde, Kel Simone, and others adding their own small influences which contributed to the greater whole. And so recognizing this fact, following the conclusion of the main Death of Deadpool story, Marvel had a series of short stories commissioned which paid homage to some of his past writers as a final farewell. Having said that, Deadpool Roast the Marvel Universe initially picks up with Wade in the midst of a robbery after having been contacted by an unnamed client. In addition, the client in question had specified that no matter what happens, under no circumstances is Deadpool to touch the item he's stealing, but because Wade does what he wants when he wants and how he wants, Wade seizes the item and makes his way outside. From here, we pick up with Thanos in his famous helicopter, who's revealed to be the client funding Deadpool's stealing of the Cosmic Cube. Now to sidetrack for a second, for those of you who don't know about the Thanos copter, you're missing out on one of the greatest creations in the history of Marvel. Originally appearing in Super Spidey Stories number 39 in 1979, the Super Spidey line was an anthology series containing multiple short stories designed to provide comics for a younger audience, with issue number 39 featuring Thanos stealing the Cosmic Cube in his Thanos copter. Where the story would end with Thanos being arrested by the police and taken away, the Thanos copter lived on in the hearts and minds of comic book fans everywhere who had hoped that it would make its triumphant return one day. Now where the goal of Thanos is to acquire the cube as a way to stop anyone from challenging his power with the gauntlet, Deadpool reveals that because the cube allows the wishes of its user to come true, he had tricked Thanos by stripping him of his Infinity Gauntlet and replacing him with a toy model. And so with absolute power over the universe in his possession, Deadpool does the only thing that makes sense. He holds a one night only roast of the Marvel Universe. Following this, and after creating a facility to host the roast, Wade is met by the arrival of Howard the Duck. Now this is actually a pretty cool treat in that to the best of my knowledge, we have never had an instance when Wade and Howard have met one another. Something that's also funny here is that Deadpool makes the case that he's never seen a roast all the way through. Now to be honest, neither have I, and I feel like I'm not the only one who gets bored the longer that roasts go on. The only exception I can think was during the roast of Emmett Smith, when Jamie Foxx absolutely destroyed Doug Williams, which was hilarious. But with Deadpool having used the Infinity Gauntlet to assemble Hulk, Spider-Man, Thor, and Nick Fury, we also find that the audience consists of Elektra, Wolverine, Sabretooth, Blind Al, Mephisto, and most all of Marvel's universe. Now with Storm taking the stage, the first question she asks is why Hitler's there? Now for those of you who are unaware, in Jerry Duggan's run and coming between several story arcs, Duggan alongside Poston created a series of flashback stories focusing on Deadpool in the past alongside other characters. 
In this instance, Deadpool and Nick Fury had faced off against Hitler during World War II in an effort to end his reign as dictator. While the story would tie into the historical account of Hitler committing suicide, this story also depicted Hitler being riddled with bullets, leading to the Nazis passing it off as a suicide in order to save face. What's also funny here is that Deadpool doesn't appear to understand how a roast works. In the mind of Wade, his intention was to gather the entire Marvel Universe together for the purpose of roasting everyone. But because the purpose of a roast is to make fun of a particular individual in good nature, between Cable Thor and the others, the Marvel Universe ends up roasting Deadpool with Thor unaware of why he's there. Now for me, one of the funniest moments in the comic came when the Incredible Hulk took the stage. As he tells us, Hulk is the strongest one there is, except for when it comes to farting, in which case, <laughs> in which case Deadpool makes the stinkiest farts. Now to be honest, this is actually a bit of a surprise to me in that I had always assumed that Hulk made the stinkiest farts in the Marvel Universe, and if you think the same thing, post a comment and letting me know. But after going through the first 10 minutes of fart jokes, Hulk just inexplicably smashes the podium stand and bails out. <laughs> From here, Duggan and Brian post and poke a little fun at the Nick Fury and Nick Fury Jr. situation. Now again, when Marvel launched the Ultimate Universe and introduced the alternate version of Nick Fury, he was designed specifically to look like Samuel Jackson. Now as the story goes, as far as I understand it, Samuel Jackson had not given his permission for his likeness to be used, and instead of filing a lawsuit, Jackson stated that if Marvel allowed him to play the character in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, then no issues would come of it. As a result, because Jackson's version of Nick Fury grew to be so popular, in the mainstream Marvel Universe during the story Battle Scars, Marvel introduced another version named Marcus Johnson who was written as the illegitimate son of the original Nick Fury from the Howling Commandos. While it became a bit of a running joke for a while in that a white guy fathered a child that looked nothing like him, Marcus Johnson largely remained in the background functioning within the pages of Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. taking on the name Nick Fury Jr. Now picking up with Benjamin Franklin, these characters first appeared at the beginning of Dugan's run with Deadpool Dead Presidents. Centering on a man named Michael who believed that the country was taking a turn for the worse, Michael used necromancy as a means to bring back some of America's greatest founding fathers, including Benjamin Franklin, Abraham Lincoln, and Teddy Roosevelt, under the idea that they would help to restore America's greatness. While the story would go on to see them being evil and attempting to take over the world, with the story functioning as a last hurrah, Duggan and Poston brought them back to simply poke fun at Wade and his hideous appearance. In addition to this, we also see Shikla. Now her character debuted in the digital series The Gauntlet, centering on Deadpool stealing her as Dracula's bride, which actually led into the one-shot comic The Wedding of Deadpool in issue number 27. Finally, the last person to make fun of Deadpool as part of the roast is Emily Preston. Originally dying during the Dead President's story arc, at the event's conclusion, Michael had placed the spiritual essence of Preston into the mind of Deadpool, after which it was transferred to a life model decoy, allowing her to function without anyone in S.H.I.E.L.D. knowing she was a robot. Where Duggan's run on Deadpool will continue to see her go on as a main character in Wade's life by helping him to locate his daughter Eleanor, in the death of Deadpool's storyline, Emily Preston, her son, Wade, and Eleanor were among those who died during the collapse of the multiverse and the final incursion. Finally, with Deadpool taking the stage for his final speech, to be honest, I loved this part of the story. While he makes fun of Alpha Flight a bit and saying that they're a team no one cares about, which makes sense because I imagine a lot of you watching this don't know who they are, he goes on to comment that he hasn't seen this many members of the Marvel Universe gathered into a single place since he killed them all during the story Deadpool Kills the Marvel Universe, a delightful tale where Deadpool did actually kill the entire Marvel Universe. However, in a more serious turn, he also says that he knows he makes things awkward sometimes by hitting on women of the Marvel Universe and he's done a lot of terrible things in his past. But while he makes his speech to everyone, the audience actually begins to laugh maniacally with Reed Richards and Doctor Doom coming to the realization that Deadpool's using the Infinity Gauntlet to force them all to laugh. Now where this initially seems to be Duggan and Poston losing their minds and delving into insanity while writing this story, they actually reveal that this is meant to prove a point. With Boyd breaking the fourth wall and addressing us directly, he uses the Infinity Gauntlet to reveal the tragic suffering of his life and that he's been experimented on by the Weapon X Project, subjected to torture by Dr. Kilbrew, lost his former girlfriend Vanessa Carlisle, and had his head ripped off by Apocalypse. To this end, Wade states that after putting on the Infinity Gauntlet, the entire fourth wall fell away, allowing him to see us reading the comic. As he states, his life is just as real as ours, and having to parade around in funny stories for our amusement has basically pissed him off. And while the other comic book characters of Marvel don't know that their life is a ruse or a story, Deadpool expected better of us arguing that while we may like his stories, not everyone does. However, before he can continue his rant, he's interrupted by Howard the Duck stating 
that he was Deadpool before Deadpool was Deadpool. Now for those of you who haven't seen my video on Howard, this is 100% true. In his original stories, Howard was designed to be a parody of pop culture ideas and the comic book industry. While he did lack the silliness that Deadpool has become known for, the fact remains that everything Deadpool has done so far, Howard did first, with the exception of killing the Marvel Universe, launching a core of his own, and kissing a clone of himself. And so as the story comes to a close, Deadpool essentially resets the entire situation using the Infinity Gauntlet and erasing his first encounter with Thanos. Appearing in the Thanos copter, Deadpool relinquishes control of the Infinity Gauntlet, arguing that it's more trouble than it's worth, after which Thanos kicks him out and into the water below. With that being said, we're going to bring this video to an end, and let me know how you guys feel about Deadpool getting the Infinity Gauntlet. Did you think the story was good? Do you think it could have been written better? Let me know, and I will catch you guys later. Peace.